Castlevania II, Simon's Quest is a dramatic departure from the original. There are RPG elements with health and weapon upgrades, and a much larger roster of sub-weapons and items at the player's disposal, and even a day and night cycle. The biggest change, however, is the open world concepts. There are cities to visit and branching paths to explore, and one must obtain new items to unlock new areas of Transylvania. In fact, I would be surprised if the designers of Castlevania II were not inspired by the mighty Metroid. While arcades were still immensely popular at the time, home console games could be made differently as players had more time to play the game, and pumping quarters into a machine was no longer necessary for a game to be financially successful. It is worth noting, Castlevania 2 contains nothing but a health meter on the heads-up display. There is no timer counting down, nor are there points to collect and high scores to chase. Castlevania 2 understands what it is and lets go of what is not necessary. It is commendable, and I appreciate the focus. While Simon's Quest visually resembles Metroid due to its side-scrolling nature, the game's structure more closely follows a Zelda game. Hidden in the overworld are five mansions to discover and ultimately conquer. The player must talk to people in the overworld for clues, collect items to progress, and obtain five trinkets in the five mansions to finally unlock the showdown with Dracula. On paper, Castlevania 2: Simon's Quest should be awesome. Castlevania gameplay with Zelda-like game structure? Hell yeah. Unfortunately, the cracks begin to show almost immediately. The English localization is at times horrendous and makes Castlevania II Simon's Quest unnecessarily cryptic. This wasn't uncommon for the day. The original Zelda has a rocky translation, for example. However, the Japanese version of the original Zelda was also cryptic, including Grumble Grumble. Castlevania II is sometimes solid, but other times, not so much. In the English version, an NPC states, a magic potion will destroy the wall of evil. This is troublesome for two reasons. First, one won't find magic potion. It is called holy water. Second, Wall of Evil is translated poorly. The Japanese version states the holy water causes agony to evil and breaks wicked walls. Using holy water to break walls is a crucial skill in the game, and is thankfully in the manual, but it does lead to a second issue. This NPC states a crooked trader is offering bum deals in this town. In the Japanese release, the text reads, in towns, there are sellers who do business in hiding. Had English players received this clue, it would have been more obvious to break walls and shops that don't initially seem to have any merchants in them. Instead, one has to just sort of figure it out or use a guide. While some might enjoy the lack of hand-holding found in the Western release, offering the warm, nostalgic memories of a simpler time, Japanese gamers experienced something different. What Japanese gamers did also experience was the day and night cycle. Simon's quest cycles from day to night and back. During the night, enemies require more hits to defeat and towns are basically shut down, meaning there are no NPCs to talk to and shops are closed. This does allow one to grind benign enemies for hearts, but also slows down progression. For example, after obtaining 50 hearts, which act as a magic meter and double as in-game currency, I have to wait for daytime before buying the holy water, an item mandatory for progression. While an interesting idea Idea, the implementation is poor and ends up dragging down the pace of the game considerably, padding out the game's length. After fully exploring the first town, the player can either exit to the left or to the right. With one containing enemies too powerful for Simon in his current state, the other direction feels like the obvious choice. Following the right path will eventually lead to a fork in the road and add some non-linearity to the experience. Staying on the top path will lead the player to the first mansion, while going down leads to another town. Being the cautious type, I went to the next village first. Using the clues from the first town, one can find the hidden merchant selling a dagger and the chain whip. The dagger is useless if I'm honest with an extremely short range, but it thankfully doesn't use any magic. The chain whip on the other hand is actually the second whip upgrade and is great to have before entering the first mansion. Speaking of upgrades, players can accumulate experience points and eventually level up Simon. 
However, the designers were pretty clever with this. Defeating any enemy will reward XP at the beginning of the game. After leveling up, Simon flashes, the health bar is expanded, and refilled. As Castlevania 2 lacks wall meat, the only way to restore health is by visiting a church or by leveling up. However, this cannot be cheesed. After leveling up, the enemies at the beginning of the game no longer reward XP, meaning a player can't abuse the system and max their life bar before beginning the quest proper. Instead, the player's level can only be increased incrementally, which I think does a nice job of balancing out the difficulty curve. This leads us to the first mansion. Being the first mansion, one might expect it to be straightforward and easy, and it is. In fact, the only tricky part of the entire thing are some false floors. Not all floors are solid and the player can fall through certain areas. This is ultimately annoying. Falling through the floor leads to a lot of backtracking through already traveled ground. The alternative is tossing holy water as one travels through mansions, as holy water sometimes passes through the floor, revealing the location of traps. But stopping every few steps to drop some holy water isn't exactly engaging gameplay. Sadly, the translation issues from the beginning of the game are just getting started. Assuming one tosses holy water whenever they see blocks in the game world stacked too deep, one will occasionally find books containing clues. Here a book reads, a symbol of evil will appear when you strike the stake. Inside each of the five mansions is an NPC selling oak stakes, and at the end of each mansion is a glowing object. The player is supposed to strike the object with the oak stake to obtain a symbol of Dracula. The Japanese version correctly indicates to strike the object with the stake, a much better hint. Striking the object rewards a piece of Dracula, the first being Dracula's rib. It turns out, while battling in the first Castlevania, Dracula placed a curse on Simon, which will cause a premature death. Seven years later, Simon determines he must find and burn the five body parts or relics in order to break the curse. These five relics are the rib, heart, eyeball, nail, and ring. Even better, each of the five relics is somewhat useful, either in the form of progression or in actual use. The rib for for example, acts as a shield. The eyeball allows Simon to see clues hidden in blocks, and the nail allows one to destroy breakable blocks with the whip. Sadly, neither the manual or an in-game character reveal the effects of equipping the eyeball or nail. Thankfully, their utility is never required to beat the game, so it doesn't matter. The heart and the ring, on the other hand, are items used for progression gating. The heart is needed to access the third mansion, while the ring is necessary to access the runes of Dracula's castle. Speaking of Dracula's heart, this is another area where forward progression becomes far too cryptic. The player needs to equip the relic before getting on the ferry. Doing so takes the player down an alternate path. If done correctly, a little chime plays, which makes it more obvious something has happened. If a player talks to enough NPCs, they'll be given clues like, the dead river waits to be freed from the curse, and a second clue advising, destroy the curse with Dracula's heart. Sadly, as the game was packaged without a map, and there is no in-game map, one has no way to discern what body of water is the dead river. The saving grace is the game's instruction manual, which advises one of the relics is needed to go the right way. As the player only has two relics at this point, the heart and the rib, it isn't difficult to try it twice. What does suck though is using the blue crystal to open this lake. The clue to kneeling by this lake is hiding in a terrible location, and as the player doesn't yet have Dracula's eyeball, one can't just equip it and wander around looking for clues. Instead, I guess the designers expected players to holy water every block in the overworld. This is not a localization problem. Kneel by the lake with the blue crystal is a fine translation. The clue is just poorly placed. If one does figure out this puzzle, one could reasonably assume during the next crystal exchange, blue for red, that doing the same thing at a similar looking lake would yield a similar result. And indeed it does. However, the initial puzzle is just far too cryptic. The most famous puzzle though is of course what occurs at Deborah Cliff. Mm -hmm. 
The English version of Simon's Quest contains two clues to this puzzle. The first is, wait for a soul with the red crystal on Deborah Cliff. And a second, hit Deborah Cliff with your head to make a hole. Both of these clues are garbage. The Japanese version is clear, hold a red crystal in front of Deborah Cliff and wait for a wind. However, even the Japanese version fails to mention kneeling. I like what Castlevania 2 is attempting to do here, using tools and items to gate progression so one isn't overwhelmed, and structure the adventure where the designers were in control of the player experience, but in subtle ways. It is a hallmark of a good Metroidvania title, however, the execution is absolutely awful. It would have been awesome if the player received the eyeball relic in the first mansion, which could have revealed the clue to open up the lake, leading to the second mansion, but this isn't how Castlevania 2 works. Instead, clues are either translated poorly or hidden unfairly, which makes progression painful in the first half of the game. But once these oddities are cleared, Castlevania 2 becomes much more straightforward. Equip the red crystal to lower the next lake, leading to the fifth mansion, and that is about it. One doesn't even need to equip anything to unlock Dracula's castle. Simply having the items is enough. Assuming one has gathered the five relics and actually took the time to defeat the bosses, there are no more clues to decipher. No more holy water nonsense, nothing. This leads us to the five mansions themselves and Dracula's castle. If one was hoping these would offer an experience more similar to the original game, or perhaps something more akin to a labyrinth, like in Zelda 1 or 2, one will come away disappointed. I am unable to identify any interesting level design, nor engaging enemy encounters, and certainly no intense boss battles. About the only compliment I can offer is a few of the mansions do offer a shortcut back to the entrance, but not all of them. It would have been far better if obtaining the relic warped the player back to the entrance, like Zelda did the year before. Without this feature, Castlevania 2 feels padded out, thanks to the backtracking. Still, a few shortcuts aside, there is little exploring to do and the puzzle aspect is quite weak. Inside each of the mansions is a merchant selling an oak stake. However, the merchants are either on the main linear path through the level, or just not difficult to find in the first place. This is quite unlike a Zelda game, where finding the boss key involves solving a set of puzzles using the power-ups received up to that point to test the player's skill. It was engaging, and there was a progression through the dungeon order, constantly upping the challenge. Castlevania 2 plateaus quite early. The main difficulty revolves around throwing holy water to identify false walls to progress or trap floors to avoid, which ultimately feels like wasting time. Difficulty only arrives in a few spots, where the player basically falls into enemies, which is, well, lame. Despite all of the weapon upgrades, they are rarely put to any sort of clever use. Is there an enemy below, Simon? Toss holy water. Is an enemy throwing projectiles? Hit it from the distance with a dagger. This is not depth. Some items like the diamond have the potential to be interesting, but the level design never capitalizes on it. This lack of depth carries on into the bosses. Now, I should note there is an optional power-up which kicks off this chain of easiness. Hidden in a cave shortly after the first mansion is the sacred flame. This magic item builds a wall of fire that stuns and damages enemies. While the range and utility at first seem limited, it is devastating to bosses. As one can see, death is rendered completely harmless with little effort. Unlike Castlevania 1, where some serious skill was needed to retain the holy water, along with the double and triple shots, the sacred flame is always available to the player. Destroying death rewards the golden knife. With the shield properties of the rib relic and the golden knife, the second boss Vampira is also quite easy. Vampira rewards the magic cross, the second item mandatory to enter Dracula's castle, and Dracula poses no threat to the player either, easily defeated with the sacred flame. What made Dracula so good in Castlevania was that he required precision to defeat, particularly the first phase. The fight was designed in a way to avoid stunlocking shenanigans. This level of thought and care is severely lacking in Simon's Quest. In fact, most of my deaths came from falling into water. Castlevania 2 lacks many timing-based obstacles or hazards or challenging enemy encounters, which might drain the player's life. There is this horizontal block in the second mansion, or a couple of instances of these vertical blocks which give Simon a jumping boost, but these are the only instances where any sort of timing is needed to progress through the adventure. 
Moving along, the presentation is above average. Backgrounds are detailed and the color and tile limitations of the hardware are decently mitigated thanks to talented artists. However, I can't help but feel like this game is less of a standout compared to the first. Take Dracula's Castle for example. In the original, there were large windows, curtains, and bricks showing through wallpaper, giving a lot of visual variety in the area. In Castlevania 2, most of this is gone, with tiny black windows and large, repeating bricks replacing the grungy feel. Waterfalls don't move, dungeon areas lack depth, mansions don't feel lived in, everything in Castlevania 2 feels somewhat stale. Of course, Castlevania 2 is a much larger game than the original, meaning the cartridge space or disc space was stretched much thinner. The result of the game design is a game world that is far less visually interesting. While still superior to, say, Zelda 2 or Metroid, Castlevania 2 is hardly a standout on the system. Thankfully, the soundtrack isn't lacking at all. Castlevania 2's lasting contribution to the franchise is, without a doubt, Bloody Tears. In many ways, it is almost the opposite of Vampire Killer. Now, the intro is dark and moody, offering the feeling of dread Simon must have, with his reward for defeating Dracula being a life-threatening curse. The main verse of the track is then the opposite, with a catchy and uplifting progression, offering hope the player can free Simon of his dreadful curse. And of course, there is a delightful chorus offering a catchy melody to tie it all together in a cohesive and memorable way. An underrated track has got to be Monster Dance, the music that plays during the night cycles. This follows a similar pattern to Vampire Killer, but is overall darker, closely matching the nighttime atmosphere. What I enjoy most about this track is the transitions from the highs being the focus to the lows being front and center. It matches the overall tone of the game, from bright and sunny to dark and gloomy, and is the perfect companion piece to Bloody Tears. Dwelling of Doom is another fantastic composition and really eases the monotony of the five mansions. This track is filled with energy and had the mansions been more interesting, would have captured the intensity of what should have been challenging action sequences guarding the game's five relics. Instead, it offers a stark contrast as to what is ultimately rather boring. While the soundtrack is overall less deliberate than the first game due to the game largely being unfocused compared to the first game, the soundtrack is definitely the bright spot of Castlevania 2. The composers did a masterful job utilizing the limited hardware to create deep and complex melodies rivaling other media. Despite just five primitive channels of audio and relatively new hardware compared to classical instruments and severe track length constraints, the audio engineers managed a vast array of tonal variety in each track and masterfully crafted epic music rivaling more mature mediums. So, with all of that out of the way, it is time to reach a conclusion. I won't sugarcoat it. Ultimately, Castlevania II Simon's Quest is a disappointing experience. While I wish I could declare this game to be misunderstood, with a hidden depth overlooked by modern reviewers, or somehow determined the game's open world and branching paths were the birth of the Metroidvania genre, all of this would be hyperbole. None of these statements are true. The first half of Simon's Quest is overly cryptic due to a combination of poor localization and poor design, and the game as a whole is boring because there are so few elements that challenge the player. When one does take damage, it is because of the homing nature of certain enemies, like eyeballs, birds, and spiderwebs, rather than tricky patterns like the Medusa heads of the original. When a mansion offers any semblance of difficulty, it is because of cheap enemy placement or false walls obscuring the way forward, rather than clever design or tough patterns to learn and master. In fact, Simon's Quest is by far the easiest Castlevania game I've ever beaten. I am 100% confident anyone with a guide can clear the mansions and defeat Dracula on their first sitting on a weekend afternoon. I cannot say that about the original game. And while I want to give Castlevania 2 credit for offering an extensive password save system which saves the player's current level and all power-ups collected, it is sort of a moot point with the lack of challenge presented. It is nice having unlimited continues too, with the player restarting right where they left off with full health minus XP 
HP and hearts. This is a vast improvement over, say, Zelda 2, which placed the player back at Zelda, forcing the player to retread through Hyrule to get back to their position. It is also a vast improvement over Metroid, which restarted players with a measly 30 hit points. The lack of difficulty also eases the sting of resetting the XP, as one doesn't really need to max out if they want to beat the final moments of the game. I also love the simplified HUD, which omits unnecessary elements like a score or timer. It is forward thinking, and I should give credit where credit is due. The leveling up system is also balanced, preventing players from grinding away at the beginning of the game, only to be overpowered for the rest of the adventure. But ultimately, Castlevania II Simon's Quest is a below average adventure. What it lacks in frustrating gameplay, it offers in frustratingly cryptic progression. While a competent translation would have eased the sting and offer something more thoughtful, it wouldn't be perfect by any stretch, with clues hiding in absurd locations and nothing hinting at the player's need to kneel at Deborah Cliff. Simon's Quest feels like a missed opportunity. Had the clues not been hiding, had the relics been presented to players in a more logical order, had the enemy behavior required more thoughtful item usage, had the boss encounters been more complex, maybe Simon's Quest could have risen to something more respectable. Maybe I would feel more compelled to beat the game yet again, to defeat it in less than 8 in-game days to receive the best ending. But alas, I do not. Padding out playtime thanks to shops closing at night certainly doesn't help the game cause. As it stands, Castlevania II Simon's Quest has earned its reputation as the black sheep of the classic Castlevania titles. It isn't the black sheep because it did something different. It is the black sheep because the game is a massive step back in terms of game design. A sophomore slump, if you will. Perhaps the goodness found in the original was a fluke and Castlevania II represents a regression towards the mean of the team's ability. Or maybe the designers didn't understand what made the first game so popular in the first place. Whatever it is, Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest is worse than the first game in nearly every way.